Well, we're at 1210, so I'm going to call our meeting to order. I don't have a bell to ring, so I'm just going to say ding. <laughs> Happy New Year, Rotarians. It's wonderful to see all of you. My name is David Erdley, and I'm going to serve as, I serve as the Rochester Rotary Club as the president-elect, and Ron has given me the privilege of, of leading the meeting today. So I'm going to ask us to stand as we are able and join us and join in saying the Pledge of Allegiance together. <laughs> I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United <laughs> States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Unfortunately, you don't have Paula in, in music, so I'm just going to invite you just for a moment to think about some favorite music and just listen to it in your head for just a quick second. If you've got a favorite song that you like to hear, let that song be the music interlude. And now I'm going to ask us to say the four-way test of the things that we think, say, or do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? Let me offer our invocation this morning. And as many of you saw with the email, we are keeping Dr. Shaner and his family in prayer with a sudden passing of his son, Ryan. And so just praying for peace and comfort and just all the love that our community can offer his, his family at this time as they grieve. So let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this day as we gather for our first Rotary meeting of 2021. We begin this new year in hope with the vaccines available with a chance, Lord, as the year goes on and beginning to, to meet together and to resume some of that face-to-face -face experiences and conversation that we have missed in this season. Especially, God, we lift up the Shaner family as they grieve, that you would just offer that peace that passes all understanding upon their hearts and their minds. Continue to surround them with the family and friends, Lord, at this time who will be close to them and are drawing near to them to respond with love and compassion. We pray for our community school district, Lord, our board of education, as they care for the work of the district during this time. And Lord, we pray that we will continue to place service above self as we live as Rotarians and our commitment to making this year an even better year for our club and for our community. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. No, a woman. Or we can say a person. Be safe that way. I'm going to invite guests, if you are here first, to say welcome. We're glad to have you a part of our club. And we just invite you, in the, using the chat, just to give us your name and your email or phone number so Stuart Signer and our membership committee can follow up with you with more information about our club and help to answer any questions that, that you may have during, during today's meeting as well. Fifteenth sign-in was hard because there were a lot of people that signed on all at one time. And it looks to me like Phil Loman is asking me to look to the person to my right and to his left is what it looks like. But I believe Cindy Andrews was our 15th person that Ooh. I saw. So congratulations, Cindy. Thank you. A well-deserved honor. <laughs> and I wanna ask too, if, um, if Kyle, if you have any guests to introduce today. I think so. Give me okay. one second to reread the chat. Sure. <clears throat> well, there are a couple of people here that I think are guests. Uh, we have a Kelly Messing, Christine Britton, Teresa Megan, and Ron Megan. Wonderful. You know, Ron so is our speaker, so up. we're great to have them here today. Good. Hello, Kelly. Uh, happy. <laughs> Hello to Kelly. We say hi to Kelly. Great to have Hello. all of you with us today. Hi. Welcome. And do we have happy bucks this morning as we begin, begin the new year? I don't know. Are there any Ohio State happy bucks, Phil, that we need to be aware of? I have a happy buck. Oh, okay, Christine. I had my son and daughter-in-law and grandson from Florida flew up for the holidays. We all took the test, the swab, 
and everybody was negative. So they flew up and got home safely. The planes are virtually empty and we had a great time and I am so tired of cooking. <laughs> I believe it. Uh, what a great time with family though. That is so nice to hear. Good. I know Kathy Lezinski is, is saying a happy new year to everyone on our chat. Oh, Tim Crawford, go Buckeyes. Looking forward to Monday night. Tim, glad to see you. Hope you're feeling better too. Uh, Vince has got happy to make the best snowman Sunday with the great snowfall. So way to go, Vince. Yeah, I have a quick happy buck. Yes, I Kyle. was happy to uh, run into Annette Werner at Costco over the weekend. I thought it was funny that uh, even with the masks on, you can still tell exactly who people are when you, yep. when you see them just, just by the hair and, and everything. So find me a dollar, Vince. That's awesome. That's awesome. Tim Duncan says he went snowboarding with his son over break. He was learning and he did and Tim didn't break anything. Way to go, Tim. That's always a good thing. I guess my happy buck is Michigan didn't lose in a bowl game. I had a really uplifting January 1st. I was in a good mood all day long. I thought that was kind of a cool thing. Any other happy bucks? And this goes to support our scholarship program too. I know, Shirley, do I see your hand? Yeah. Oh, you're still on mute. Okay, there. can you hear me? Yes. Um, I have a happy buck very similar to Christine's. I have had my son and daughter-in-law and three grandkids down here for uh, two weeks here in Florida and they're here until Friday and we have had just a wonderful time together. Oh, good. Yeah, it's been great to see everybody and have more people to talk to and it's just been really fun. Good. How's the weather been for you? Uh, it's been really nice, although it's cooled off a little bit this week, but that's okay because the kids actually have to go back to school. So they are, everybody's in their own room right now doing their remote learning. The parents are at work, the kids are at school, and here I am. <laughs> oh, awesome. Thank yeah. you, Shirley. You're welcome. Thank you. Ah, uh, Stuart. Yeah, thank you, Stuart. Happy buck for the Michigan Wolverine basketball team. Good to see. That was a great win. I had, yeah, I had one on there too, Dave. Oh, Ron Lichto, happy to celebrate 50 years of my honey putting up with me. <laughs> That's great. And then Tim Crawford is, I'm assuming he's asking Michigan fans if we have a coach. That's a good question. What do you think? <laughs> I guess we'll find out. Well, thank you for the happy bucks. Let me share. We've got several member birthdays this week that we're celebrating. Um, Steve Cooper and Eric Whipple are both on January 6th. Jerry Murphy is on the 8th, and Frank Wewald is January 10th. So I'm going to invite us to join in singing happy birthday to our Rotarians. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Rotarians. Happy birthday to you. Five dollars, please. Now you know why I'm not part of the choir. So good singing, everyone. And then we have a club anniversary. Uh, John Madetz is celebrating 28 years. And so congratulations, John, on 28 years as a Rotarian and just his commitment to Rotary and how he is just lived out Rotary's values with his work in the funeral home and especially in our community as well. Are there announced club announcements? that need to be shared. I'm gonna kind of scroll the screen. So I just, if you have an announcement, you wanna either start speaking or wave your hand and I'll have you speak. I don't see anyone. I don't know, Ron, do we have any announcements that you're aware of? No? Okay. Not that I'm aware of. Okay, okay. How do we get some master's tickets? Ah, good question. Thank you, Tom. We actually Crawford had the an first answer. three master tickets go out today to George Crozier. So he's got tickets one, two, and three. Wonderful. We only have 297 more to go. So anybody can request tickets to me and right. I can leave them in an envelope and you can pick them up in the office. Uh, or we could uh, even mail them to you if we need to do that as well. So contact Tim Crawford if you'd like to get master's tickets and you can pick them up either at his office or I guess they can mail them if, if necessary. Thank you, Tom. That was a great announcement. 
Vince, do you want to share with the club? I was really, really pleased when you shared with me and Ron the response to supporting the Rivercrest staff. So we did uh, through the billings of the um, the Rotarians, we provided a tip to the River how, the Rivercrest staff of twenty two hundred dollars. Wow, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. That is such great news. And I, I, I know that's an increase from last year's, uh, I think several hundred dollars too, if I remember right. It is, yeah. So I, I did meet with uh, Nino, gave him the money right before New Year's. He said, Mary will be very pleased and excited to see us back. Oh, awesome, good. Thank you so much, Vince, for doing that. And sure. thank you, Club. Thank you for your generosity in remembering the waste staff at Rivercrest. It's, it's a significant gift for them. Are we still looking for a new home for lunch? That will, yes, that will be part of the, the work um, this year. I'll be part of that, leading that team. I think, Christine, you are maybe be part of it as well. Um, Nino is, is going to be continuing to, to be in business through the end of 2021, but beginning of 2022, we'll be, be looking for a, a new place to have our, our lunch meeting. Uh, Rivercrest is going gonna, is gonna to close at the end of the year, and so we'll be working on getting a, a new location set up for early 22. And if you have suggestions, please feel free to, to let me know or, or to Ron as well um, as, as we are wor be working on that this first part of the year. I don't see any other announcements. Um, the Rotarian of the week, I know that half, last, last record I have from Ron is that half Walton handed it to Stu. Yes. And I'm curious, Stu, if you're ready to hand it off to the first person to be honored in 2021. To unload this thing, right? I wish I had. It. I wish I could physically. Actually, have this. actually, Stu, we had some unloading before the meeting happening too. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, and Christine I, can tell you about that. Oh, good. In a private, private time. Good. No, actually, it was a load up. <laughs> oh, load. <laughs> it has been unloaded now. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> good. Well, you know, uh, there's uh, there are many um, worthy Rotarians that I can think of. Uh, to present this prestigious award to, but uh, I've got somebody specific in mind that's really, um, that I've been involved with for, for quite some time uh, on the membership committee with, uh, with him not even being a part of it, but really assisting and, and helping out. Um, he, uh, he's also been a, a, a key person uh, guiding us on this governance project team um, and doing uh, tons of work for that. So I, I'd like to give it to Ray Dorr. Ah, congratulations, Ray. Ray. <clears throat> Thank you, Stuart, and congratulations, Ray. Ray, do you have anything to say about, about the recognition? Stuart, thank you very much. Um, you've been a great part of, of Rotary membership and on the uh, governance document uh, project team. And uh, so I thank you very much. And uh, we'll continue to move forward, right? Yes, sir. Go, go team. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Stuart, and thank you, Ray. We do have a sheriff's report for the first Tuesday of January. So Steve Shettenhelm, we've got, we have the best bringing us our first sheriff, sheriff's report for 2021. Well, we'll uh, we'll see what we can do about that. Um, I guess we'll measure the fines at the end and uh, know for sure. But uh, happy New Year to everyone out there! Uh, it's great to welcome in 2021, and uh, hopefully forget much of the bad stuff of the 2020 year. Um, so just remember, it's a buck for every time you've written on uh, anything 2020. Um, so we'll kind of keep track of that. Um, I don't know if you knew this, but uh, the sheriff's fines have doubled this year and it's $10 uh, now, but really that's just an April Fool's joke, We're just ahead of our time, so we'll stick to $5. Um, looking around the screen, um, and I think, you know, somebody was kind of trying to steal my, uh, my info here, kind of my shtick here. Uh, we did, you know, you guys got to get here early because that's when all the fun happens on this uh, Zoom call. Uh, Christine Haig was giving us, uh, actually, you know, she had uh, diaper pictures and uh, taught about full diapers and, you know, I mean, anytime we can talk a lot about potty training and all that, I mean, I think, you know, you're, you're ahead of your game there. So that's a $5 fine if you missed any of that. Uh, Christine, uh, because you ended up with the dirty diaper, uh, no fine for you today. 
Um, also, we you know we know that John Gaber is the smartest guy. We've we've said that for years. However, I'm a little bit concerned about his uh, ability to use the iPhone because I continually seem to be losing him and his picture there. So I don't know where John is right now, but that's a great picture of a doorway or something uh, he's got going there. Also, uh, might be sending out the police to check on Tom Delpop. I notice uh, he's missing. He's got a picture going, but I, I didn't see him in there the last time I looked. So we're a little bit concerned about that. Um, appreciate the president making sure that it's okay for all you people that have generally have music in your head. Um, so there's no fine for that because uh, there's probably people out there that are humming all the time. So apparently that's been, uh, been okay this year. Um, if you're, uh, if you enjoy the holidays and you're out of town, that's a, that's a $5 fine. If you're still trying to get your Christmas cards out, that's just plain late and that's a $2 fine. Uh, if you're taking gifts back, that's a $3 fine. If you re-gifted something this year, that's going to be a $5 fine. Uh, switching to today in history, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge uh, was started uh, this year, uh, today uh, in 1933. Um, and so if you've ever driven across the bridge, walked across the Big Mac on Memorial Day, or you've been on a bridge too far, uh, all those things are $5 fines. Um, American trader and British uh, Brigadier General Benedict Arnold. Uh, he had his greatest success as a British commander on this day um, in, a, in a battle. And uh, so if you've ever uh, been called a traitor or you have ever had eggs Benedict, those are both $5 fines. Um, let's see, today in 1978, the band, the Sex Pistols broke up. Uh, so if I made you chuckle by saying sex, that's a, a, a $5 fine for junior high sense of humor. Get your mind out of the gutter. Um, New Year's is always the time for resolutions. Uh, so if you've made a resolution, it's four bucks. If you've already broken it, that's five bucks. Um, I know, and I unfortunately I didn't see him here, but uh, I heard that Brian Barnett has resolved, uh, resolved that he's going to stop telling people that he was the... Uh, past super mayor of the world or whatever it was that they called it um, because he's always talking about that. Uh, Maria Willett uh, has resolved that she will stop rolling her eyes whenever Brian Barnett tells people he was the super mayor of the world. Uh, Rush Shelton, who has anybody seen Rush Shelton? I, you know, I don't see him zooming out here, but he's agreed that he's going to smile more. Um, so hopefully we'll see him uh, soon to do that. Uh, Phil Roman has resolved to sit quietly during the meeting. Um, any bets on how long that'll take? Um, but that is one of the benefits to Zoom now because the master control can you know, mute you at any time. So be, be careful. Hopefully it doesn't mute me before I'm done. Um, Dave Archibald is uh, obviously is resolved every year to try to be on time. And uh, Mo, who I also don't see on here, but yeah, he's agreed to show up at meetings without having his hand out looking for uh, collecting on his, uh, his bills. Uh, but I hear somehow he's going to get on Zoom and actually send you a check uh, to get his money collected that way instead. So be aware if you see uh, uh, Mo out on Zoom. Uh, also, just a couple of quick holiday notes. Um, keep in mind, it's National Walk Your Pet Month. Not sure if the uh, orthopedic surgeons have kind of the in on that. They are encourage you to go out and walk during the iciest month. So I think it's, uh, you know, walk, uh, walk your dog month and fix your hip month. So uh, if for $5, if you're anybody in the medical profession that you're trying to screw up work that way. It's also California Dried Plum Digestive Month. These are real, these are, you can find them on the internet. Uh, so now we know what we're going to do with all that toilet paper that we had uh, ordered up. So I don't know if there, you know, maybe there were a lot of prunes at the Hague house. Uh, I don't know what, what's going on over there, but we got that going. So uh, it all goes to charity. So uh, thank you very much and uh, enjoy. Thank you so much, Steve. As always, you brought your A game as we begin this year. You set the standard high. And if you'd like to, to in the chat feature, if you'd like to do a, a fine for today or a fine, be fine for the month, as many of us have been doing, 
uh, with our Zoom meeting, you can put that in a chat and Vince will see that and then he will send you an email to follow up so that you can, you can pay your fine as well. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Tim Duncan as he introduces our speaker for today. All right, uh, good afternoon, Rotarians. Uh, today, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Mr. Ron Megan. Ron has been friends of the Rochester Hills Public Library board member uh, since 2011, became the vice president in 2012 and president in 2014. In addition to his friends board duties, Ron is also an active volunteer for book, for book sales, other friends fundraisers, and works as a library Melcat volunteer when COVID isn't around. Outside the library, Ron volunteers at the Rochester Hills Museum at Van Hoosen Farm doing photo archiving and is the membership chairperson for CORE, which is the Community Organization Resource Exchange. On a statewide basis, Ron is the chairman of the board of Michigan Christian Campus Ministries, an organization that supports, supports campus ministries at 12 universities in the state of Michigan. Ron and his wife, Teresa, have been married for 48 years and have lived in Rochester Hills since 1978. They have been longtime members of Meadowbrook Christian Church in Rochester Hills. Ron worked for General Motors Powertrain as an assistant chief engineer for engine design and retired in 2008 with 44 years of service. His last project at General Motors was designing the LS9 engine for the ZR1 Corvette. Ron likes history and he and Teresa both enjoy reading, entertaining and travel. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Ron Megan. Thanks, Tim. Welcome. And uh, having heard a little bit of what's going on here, I understand how the Rotary gets so much money to donate to folks. Uh, fines, fines, fines. Uh, I want to thank Christine Haig for asking me to speak today. I always have a hard time saying no to Christine, but I, I really enjoyed putting this together. It brought back a lot of uh, memories from when I was, was working. Um, let me, I'm going to share my screen if I could. And uh, I got a PowerPoint presentation I'd like to go over with you. Well, I got to get, get to the right thing here. Okay. Um, as it says, I'm going to be talking about the LS9 engine, which was in the 2009 Corvette ZR1. Um, I was the assistant chief engineer, and as an as assistant chief, I was totally responsible for the design, development, and validation of the engine, as well as uh, having coordination responsibility for the purchasing of the components, the manufacture of the components, the assembly of the engine, and then the integration of the engine into the vehicle. Uh, it was a, one of my favorite projects, as you can imagine, and uh, as I was putting this presentation together, I was wondering, why did I retire? But that, that thought didn't stay in my mind very long. It, it went away pretty quickly. What I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to give an engine program overview. I'll talk a little combustion tutorial because combustion is the key thing that uh, created the power that this engine was able to produce. I'll talk about some of the engine content. And then I want to go back and talk about the analysis that we did, the packaging that we were involved in, how we made sure that the engine was durable, and then kind of sum things up at the end. This was a 2009 program, but it actually started in 2005. Our vice president at the time, Tom Stevens, he said, uh, I want you to create this engine for the Corvette, and I want the first number to be a six, meaning 600 plus horsepower. At the time, uh, the, the highest horsepower engine we had in a Corvette was about around 500 horsepower, so significant increase. Uh, we decided to use the 6.2 liter engine, which was similar to the base engine in the Corvette. And we targeted 100 horsepower per liter. We thought that was a nice round number. So that got us to 620 horsepower as our target. And we decided to use a supercharger to get this performance uh, because and I'll talk about this a little later, superchargers give you instantaneous response. So when you, when you hit the gas, you've got the power that you're looking for. And I'll talk a little bit about, more about that as we go forward. So a little bit about combustion. Um, in the engine cylinder, you mix air and fuel and you add spark and you get 
some combustion, which is basically an explosion that occurs. That combustion causes the piston to move downward. That rotates the crankshaft and it turns the drivetrain and then it goes into your wheels. If you can add more air, you can increase the amount of fuel and that means you'll get a bigger explosion, which means you'll get more power. Turbochargers and superchargers compress the air that goes into the cylinder and that allows more air to enter. Turbos are driven by exhaust gas. And so there's a lag time between the time the exhaust gas gets up to the turbine and you start generating the compressed air. With a supercharger is driven off the crankshaft. So as soon as you uh, hit the, the gas, the crankshaft starts turning and you get instant to, instantaneous delivery of the compressed air. So that's kind of the, the, the basis for what we were trying to accomplish here. Here's a picture showing an exploded view of the uh, components in the engine. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We'll come back to it a little bit later at the end after I uh, do some description about some of the things that are involved here. 76% of the components in the LS9 were common with other small block engines, which was a good thing because that meant we could, we could take advantage of the economies of scale of having uh, you know, parts that were made by the millions and, and, and use them in our, in our engine. But the other 24% needed to change and they needed to change for several reasons. It could be for power, it could be for durability, or it could be for packaging in the vehicle. Some of the key components that I wanna talk about now are the supercharger and intercooler, which was the, the thing that got us the power. And then the impacts of that on the block, the pistons, the rods, uh, we added piston oil squirters, which was the first time a General Motors engine had that in production. And we had to make changes to the accessory drive, our cylinder heads and head gaskets, fuel injectors. And then uh, I'll talk a little bit about a dry sump oil system a little bit later and, and explain to you what that's all about. The supercharger was a brand new supercharger in that year. Uh, we partnered with Eaton and they called it their Twin Vortices Series or TVS Supercharger. It was a larger displacement, which gave us the range of compressor effectiveness that we were looking for. It had 2.3 liters of displacement, which means for every rotation of the rotors, there was 2.3 liters of air that were compressed and pumped into the cylinders. And we had a max boost of 10 and a half PSI. This, de this delivered the tremendous low end pull that we were looking for, but yet we didn't have any high end fall off. And you'll see that when we get to the horsepower and torque curves later on. The basis for this supercharger was a four lobe rotor. Uh, typically in the past, they'd been three lobes. Uh, this, looking at this rotor, it was actually twisted from 160 degrees from end to end. And so that allows as the thing turns and it would then compress the air between those rotors and inject it into the, into the cylinders. The rotor's top speed was over 15,000 RPM. Uh, the, the rotors intermeshed. And the thing that was different about this particular supercharger is the way they designed it, the shape of the lobes, the way the lobes uh, were twisted, and the coating allowed us to eliminate some of the supercharger whine that you're typically used to hearing. So we wanted to make this uh, as quiet as we could so that it, you were just hearing the engine perform, not the supercharger whining. We actually put an abradable powder coat on the rotors to provide uh, minimum clearance and maximum performance. Basically, this coating was on the rotors. When they started to turn in, that coating would abrade away so that the minimum amount of clearance would be there so we could get maximum performance. Now, when you compress air, you also generate heat. So the other thing we needed to do was uh, cool that down a little bit. And so we, we designed a liquid to air heat exchanger system mounted above the supercharger. Um, we were able to lower the inlet temperatures by 140 degrees Fahrenheit, which is very, very significant in something like this, uh, which again, the lower the temperature, the denser the charge, the more fuel you can add, the bigger the explosion. And so we had a dual brick intercooler on this LS9 these are the two bricks that you can see right there. And I'll show in the next slide, I'll show you a little bit how this all comes together. 
Here's the supercharger, the housing, the rotors are down below here. Um, as the rotors turn, they generate compressed air, which comes out of this uh, triangular shaped area. This piece is actually mounted on top of this. So the air comes up through this center section, goes through the two intercooler bricks, and then back down into the cylinders. And when you put the top back on, this is what the whole thing looks like. So now that we got the uh, airflow and the combustion that we were looking for, we had to start making sure that we had components that would withstand that additional pressure. Um, we used an aluminum block. We made some, it, it was a shared casting with all the other 6.2 liter blocks that the small blocks put in production. We were able to make a bulkhead strengthening by over 40% over the previous year. And when I talk about the bulkheads, I'm talking about this section of the block right down here where the bearing caps are mounted. Um, once we made that change to the block, we actually put those same changes into the rest of the 6.2 liter small block engines. So even though they didn't need that extra capability, it was easier for us to make one casting and one machining than to, uh, you know, for economies of scale. We used forged steel bearing caps. They were dowel aligned and all the surfaces were fully machined. You can't see it in this here, but we had eight block mounted oil squirters, one for each piston. And I'll show you that in a, in a slide coming up. The blocks were deck plate bored and honed, which we don't typically do, but basically what that means is we put a steel plate in place of where the, the cylinder heads would normally mount, bolted them down so that when we bored and honed the block, the any distortion that would be created by uh, attaching the heads to the engine would be compensated for. And that made the uh, bores smoother and rounder and uh, easier to uh, get the pistons up and down in. And then again, because of the uh, power that was going on here, we needed to put in a forged steel crankshaft. Most, most crankshafts in the small block were uh, cast iron. This one was forged steel, which gave us the strength that we were looking for. Okay, pistons and rods. Um, we used high strength forged pistons. This was a 9.1 compression ratio engine, uh, which is lower than normal, but because we had the supercharger, we didn't need to have a, a high compression ratio engine, which gives you a, a problems in terms of uh, spark knock and things like that. But because we have this uh, extra heat coming in from the combustion process, we had to anodize the top land. And when I talk about the top land of the piston, I'm talking about this section right here. So as the combustion occurs and forces down on the piston, that area heats up. And just basic aluminum wouldn't handle that. So we anodized the top land, which uh, was a electrochemical process, which gives us better higher temperature capability and load capability. We also put polymer coated skirts. Um, and I got these people sitting here and I'm gonna, there we go. I'm, when I talk about the polymer coating, I'm talking about this section of the piston right here. Um, as a piston goes up and down in the cylinder, there is really no metal to metal contact. Uh, the piston rides on a thin film of oil. Unfortunately, when it's cold, the uh, oil drains down off the bores it's sitting down in the pan and it takes a while when you start the engine up for that oil to get up and, and provide that oil film that you were looking for. So by, poly by providing this polymer coating on the edge of the piston skirt, we were able to uh, take care of that in the cold stages and it also provided some, uh, some noise improvements as well. Think of uh, a Teflon coated pan that keeps your eggs from sticking to the metal. That's basically what we did. We put Teflon coating on this to give us a little extra safety factor until we could get the oil there that we needed. Uh, like I said, we used oil spray cooling, which is the first ever used on a small block. This little piece was screwed into the uh, cylinder block into the oil passages. And then as the uh, oil pump would, would pulse, there would be a squirt of oil that would come up and it was targeted for the underside of the piston up underneath the, the piston assembly. And that provided cooling which again helped with the combustion pressures and temperatures that we were creating. 
And then the other thing about this assembly is we used titanium connecting rods. Titanium is very strong, very light. It helped us from a, a standpoint of handling the loads, but it also allowed us to uh, allow this piston to go up and down at a little higher speed than normal. Okay, we have to drive the supercharger somehow and uh, packaging was a significant impact uh, to us. So we went to a two belt uh, accessory drive system. Normally you'll, you'd add a, a third belt uh, to uh, drive the supercharger. So because it's got a lot of high load of the, on the supercharger, we couldn't do that because of packaging. So we added uh, a two belt system where the AC and the generator were on one belt, the supercharger, the power steering pump, and the water pump were on a different belt. We had to go to a very wide belt, 11 ribs, as opposed to a seven or eight rib belt that we would typically use in order to handle the load. The water pump bearing had to be larger to handle the load from the supercharger. And we wound up remote mounting the power steering pump to address that load situation. And then cylinder heads and gaskets. Um, I'm not gonna go through the technical details here, but. Suffice it to say that a, a T6 aluminum in a rotor cast process had a uh, better load carrying capability than the previous material and process that we had used. And we needed that because again, the, the head was the upper end of the combustion process. We put a wing that you can't see here in the intake port, which created a swirl motion, which provided for better combustion in the cylinder. And then we used four active layer head gaskets and 12 millimeter stainless steel head bolts. And I'll talk a little bit more about that on a, on a slide coming up. I kept talking about more air, more fuel. Well, you got, when you get more fuel, you got to have bigger fuel injectors. So we had injectors that allowed us to meet the 58 grams per second fuel flow requirement that we were looking for. But unfortunately, they would be too much fuel flow at idle. So we wound up developing a dual pressure fuel system. One operated at 600 kPa for high speed and wide open throttle, and then 250 kPa for idle and low speed. And that allowed us to uh, uh, get the, the dynamic range that we were looking for on the fuel system. We used center feed fuel uh, rails, which means that when the fuel came in, it came in here in the center on both sides, which helped to uh, have less ver pressure variation from cylinder to cylinder and injector to injector. And this engine required premium fuel. It's not premium fuel recommended. It was premium fuel required because of the uh, spark issues that we were address, needed to address. And then the final component I want to talk about in detail here is the dry sump oil system. In a typical engine, you have an oil pan, which houses five or six or seven quarts of oil, depending on the engine. You've got a uh, pickup tube and an oil pump in there, and that oil is then pumped through the engine as needed. In a high performance vehicle where you've got rapid accelerations, rapid decelerations, you've got high cornering uh, issues. If you had an oil pan with a lot of oil in it that would tend to slosh around, it would come up and impinge on the crankshaft, which causes Believe it or not, it causes enough friction that it can, it can really significantly impact the horsepower that's being generated. Plus, if you're in a severe turn, the oil pump uh, pickup tube might be uh, out of the oil, and that's not good. So in high performance vehicles, we'll typically put in a dry sump oil system, which means you've got a very a small oil pan in the engine. It doesn't have any oil in it that it's relying on. We actually have all the oil in this dry sump, which is externally mounted to the engine. And then there's a pump that pumps the oil to the engine and a pump that pumps the oil back out of the engine from the, the small pan in order to accomplish things. Uh, we were able to then, instead of going to a seven quart system or a six quart, we were up to 10 and a half quarts of total oil capacity here with this, with this uh, system. And uh, we use mobile, mobile One synthetic oil, which is pretty typical now these days. 
So going back to the exploded view, uh, I've talked about a lot of these parts, so you have a little better understanding of things. Here's the rotors for the supercharger, the supercharger housing, the intercooler bricks, the intercooler cover. You can see the fuel rail over here. Here's the block. Here's that shallow oil pan that we were able to use. The other thing that does provide is that um, because of packaging again, if you've got a real shallow oil pan, you've got less height that you need to be concerned about. This is all the uh, components that go up into making in the cylinder head. These are the pistons and rods that go together, the crankshaft, all the accessory drive components. And then back here, you can see the exhaust manifolds and the flywheel. So that's all it is, folks. That's all that it takes to make an LS9. So I want to go back a little bit to the beginning here. And I wanted to talk about how we started this process. As you recall, I said we were looking to have 100 horsepower per liter or 620 horsepower. Before we built part one, we used power analysis to perform simulations. We performed over 370 simulations. And just to give you an understanding of why, it would take us 24 hours to do a simulation on the computer. It would take us nine weeks to build an engine. So if we built an engine, took nine weeks and found out that whatever we tried didn't work, we'd have to rebuild it, try it again, rebuild it, try it again. We were able to do this all on the computer. Uh, and we were able to take a look at valve train lift and timing, supercharger size and boost, inlet and exhaust restrictions, intercooler performance, and a whole myriad of other things because we wanted to make sure that the components we plan on putting together would meet the performance objectives of the program, the 620 horsepower. And I'll, I'll tell you that when we built our first engine, after we did all that analysis, we came within three and a half percent of our prediction, which for a, you know, starting out of the box, that was, uh, that was pretty good. I've talked about packaging. Once we knew we had something that would perform, we needed to fit it in the vehicle. And because this was a Corvette, we needed to keep it low because the Corvette had vehicle down vision requirements, meaning when you're a driver, you want to be able to see the, as much of the road as you can as you're, as you're going around the track. Um, but we had a supercharger and intercooler, which was going to sit on top of the engine. And so that needed to be kept and, and packaged in this low space. And the Eaton supercharger that we designed and the dual brick intercooler that I discussed earlier fit the space, not with a lot to spare, uh, but with enough to, to, to get us into production. We also needed to keep it short due to steering rack requirements. And as I said earlier, normally you'd add an extra belt drive for the supercharger, but that wasn't possible in this case. So we combined the, the supercharger, water pump, and power steering on one belt, and then we designed the necessary, necessary durability improvements into the uh, components, as I talked earlier. So it's one thing to generate performance and then you can package it in a tight space, but then you need to make sure that the components are durable for the life of the engine. I went through the content descriptions and I talked about some of the things that we need needed to do on the various components. But one of the things I didn't go into detail on was uh, the challenge that we had with our head gaskets. Uh, think about it, you've got 638 horsepower pumping in the cylinders and what that tends to do every time that explosion occurs is it tends to move the head and the block away from each other. So what the head gasket has to do is to compensate for that so you don't lose any of the charge out into the atmosphere. We measured 19 microns of lift at maximum cylinder pressure. And a typical small block head gasket was two layers of steel that could handle 10 microns of lift. So we had to add two more, two more layers, go to a four layer gasket, and that was able to handle 20 microns of lift, which covered the 19 that we were seeing. Um, but also we needed to make sure that the clamp load on that gasket was where it needed to be. And the 11 millimeter uh, head bolts that are used on other small blocks didn't provide enough clamp load. So we had to go to a 12 millimeter a bolt in order to cover that. <clears throat> The changes that we made here allowed us to pass the GM thermal cycle test, which is a test that simulates 10 years of daily starts at cold temperature. 
you start it up, you warm it up, you shut it down, you start it up, you warm it up, you shut it down. You do that over and over again, all at wide open throttle, and you simulate 10 years of that happening. And that was a very brutal test and we were able to pass it with flying colors. So how did we do? Well, we exceeded our performance objectives. We generated 638 horsepower to our target of 620. We had a 595 foot pound target of torque. We generated 604. We were able to fit all that in a pretty compact package. And we created an engine that looks so good that we put a window in the hood to show it off. And I wanna talk a little bit about that here with this picture of the, uh, the hood and the, the, the clear window and the top of the supercharger uh, uh, intercooler cover there. Engineers are involved with form, fit, and function. That's what we try to accomplish. Designers have a whole different thought process. You wouldn't believe the number of meetings we spent with the design staff going over and over and over and over and over what color blue we should be using, what the shape of the letters needed to be, whether the aluminum should all be polished, should some of it be brushed, should some be polished and some brushed. It was quite a process that was uh, a little bit different than what our normal engineering mind would, uh, would accomplish. So, but we, I think we came up with something that looks pretty good. And finally, we ran over 7,000 hours of dynamometer testing and countless miles of vehicle testing to prove that the LS9 was durable. Here's the, uh, the base engine in the Corvette back in 2008, generated 436 horsepower, 430, 424 foot-pounds of torque. We had a, a higher performance uh, engine vehicle called the Z06, and that generated 505 horsepower and 470 foot-pounds of torque. And then we created our LS9, and you can see the, the difference in horsepower, 638 horsepower, over 100 and, well, 133 horsepower more than the, the, the uh, LS6. And when you look at the torque curve, it's, it's a beast. And when you drive this vehicle and you put your foot into it, it slams you back into the seat. And what creates that, that feeling is all this torque that's there. And, and, and again, torque from the very low RPMs all the way up. Very impressive vehicle to drive. So what's happened since 2008? Well, the C6 Corvette was replaced by the C7 and now the C8. And, and when I talk C6, 7, and 8, what we're talking about, the C stands for Corvette and the 6 stands for generation. Uh, the sixth generation Corvette was the one that we put the LS9 in. In, in uh, the C7 was replaced by the LT5 engine. Um, LT5 engine, and this was several years later, instead of 638 horsepower, it generated 755. Instead of 604 foot-pounds, it generated 715, and that was in its standard mode. But they also had a high-performance intake manifold that you could get, which would bring it up to 772 horsepower, a 20% improvement on what we were able to do back in, in 2008 and 9. The way they did it was with a new TVS supercharger from Eaton, and instead of the 10.5 PSI boost that I talked about, they, they were up, able to get it up to 14 PSI boost. And that required a new intercooler to take even more uh, heat out of the combustion charge. And that drove power back into the engine. So they had to put, come up with an even different steel alloy crankshaft. And there were a bunch of other things that they had to do in order to make this thing work in the uh, C7 Corvette. Now the C8 mid-engine, which just came out last year, may have a supercharged version in the future. We don't know that yet. And the question is, will the first number be an eight? I, I kind of think it will be if we have a supercharged version. As you've probably read, uh, they're also talking about electric vehicles, electric Corvettes. So uh, we'll see where that all takes us. Um, one of the things that 
we do in order to do our final validation of a vehicle is we create a captured test fleet. Uh, once the production tooling is available, we, we, we actually built 200 vehicles and the engineers and managers were uh, given those vehicles to drive. Unfortunately, we had to, we had to spend a summer driving Cor uh, ZR1 Corvettes. Um, and what we would do then is every week we would have to report any issues that we saw, any problems, any uh, with performance, with durability, with something that was making noise, something breaking. And then uh, we would use that to get feedback to the rest of the engineers to make sure that we, we made improvements before we actually went into production with the, with the final customer. Here's the uh, ZR1 that I drove for the summer. Uh, nice bright yellow, very attractive to uh, officers of the law. I shouldn't say that with the sheriff on the call, but um, you can see this vehicle parked in front of our house. We also were able to take it up north on a couple trips. A, a cute story when we were up in Grayling, um, no, actually Gaylord. We were in Gaylord and we were heading over to Charlevoix and it was a Saturday morning and I was, it, my vehicle had gotten dirty on the drive up. So I, I there was a little uh, gas station where a bunch of Boy Scouts were doing some car washes and I pulled this in and they all, they're all, their mouths all dropped open. And the one kid says, I think we need to get the new towels for this one. So that was kind of cute. And then we were able to take uh, the ZR1 to the uh, 2008 Woodward Dream Cruise. Here's a picture of us driving two of them into the Eaton uh, section where we had them on display. And then here's me with a, with a couple of the other ones. Uh, and finally, obviously we had a lot of press on this particular engine. I've uh, copied the covers from Car and Driver, Road and Track and Motor Trend, which all talked about the ZR1. And then Hot Rod did an eight page article on the, uh, the LS9 engine. This picture was taken and, and put in the Hot Rod magazine in, in our performance build center out in Wixom, Michigan, where all the LS9 engines were built. They were hand built, by the way, each, each engine hand built by one person. And that person would actually uh, sign his name with an etching pen on the uh, cylinder head to let everybody know how proud he was of building that particular engine. Any questions? How many tickets did you get when you first started driving it? I was very, very careful. I didn't get any, no. I, I picked the right spots to do the drive. And I did give several people a, uh, an experience. I was not allowed to let anybody else drive it. Uh, that was uh, one of the requirements. Uh, we, we were all given uh, driving training in order to be able to handle that kind of uh, performance. And uh, I didn't, I didn't let anybody drive it, but I gave a whole bunch of rides and uh, everybody seemed to be pretty excited. One of our ladies, sweet little lady from our church, she was um, a, a NASCAR fan and you never would have expected it seeing, seeing her, but I, I gave her a ride after church one day and I came around the corner and I said, are you ready, Bonnie? And she says, I'm ready. And I nailed it, shifted into second, nailed it again, and came down to uh, idle and I looked over at her and she said, I wasn't ready. <laughs> Other questions for, for Ron. Did Ron, you... how long did it take to develop the design and uh, from start to manufacturing? We started Ray in um, January <clears throat> of 2005 and we went into production uh, full production in uh, October of 2008. Well, that's very good. Yeah. Ron, Bob wants to know if you ever took it on the Belle Isle track or was the track not in existence at that time? No, I was never, never on that Belle Isle track. I did, I did take it on at the General Motors Proving Ground. We had a track that we uh, created that was 
an amalgamation of a bunch of different tracks around the country. Um, and we had, you know, we took the, the straightaways and the curves and so forth from various tracks and we tried to simulate them on this road course. It was called the Milford Road Course. And uh, that was a fun one to get around. That's by Dave Sauce. What would that car do in a quarter mile and what was the top end on it? The uh, quarter mile was, uh, I, I, don't, I don't remember the quarter mile time. The 0 060 was three and a half seconds. Cool. <laughs> and uh, top speed was 204 miles an hour. Um, uh, if any of you are familiar with the Nürburgring, which is a, a, a race course in Germany, it's kind of a, a, a very significant testing ground for a lot of high performance vehicles. We set the, the course record at that time uh, for a production vehicle on that track. I'm sure it's been broken since then, specifically with the new uh, the new ZR ones that have been out there. But, um, just to give you an example, uh, three and a half second zero to 60 with a supercharged 638 horsepower engine. The new C8 with the mid engine application only generates about 495 horsepower and it's zero to 60 because of the, uh, the traction that it has with the mid engine application is 2.8 seconds, zero to 60. So if they ever do the, this, the ZR1 with the first number being an eight, who knows what that's gonna do. Think about it. 60 miles an hour in 2.8 seconds. Ron, typically tire design limits max speed. Uh, is that the limit at 240? 204. 204? 204. I think the, the tires were rated for like 220. Um, the highest we could get it uh, was 204. And we, we, did, we didn't do any... Uh, uh, limiting until we got to that point. You know, so that was that was the capability of every vehicle out there. Did you drive it at 204 miles an hour? I, I never drove it at 204. I drove it, the, probably the most I got it up to was 160, 165. <laughs> that was at our, by the way, that wasn't on roads, that was at our road course out at Milford. <laughs> that wasn't on Telegraph? No. <laughs> What's well, the, I'm watching a lot of Rotarians kind of drooling no, and just smiling as you talk about the engine and the power of the vehicle. That's been fun to watch. <laughs> it's a fun project. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, and everybody asked me, was that your favorite project? And, and it was not, it was one of my favorite projects. I, I had three that I really enjoyed during the course of my, I, I never had a bad project, but I had three that I really enjoyed. This was one of them. Yeah. Very good. I, I, I can't even imagine. Uh, back 1978, I bought a 78 280ZX Turbo 2 plus 2. Got a ticket from the dealership to pick up my wife. <laughs> I can't imagine that much horsepower. Well, you know, and, and everybody was concerned about, okay, you, you got this horsepower and this torque. How manageable is it? I got to say that the vehicle guys did an outstanding job. This vehicle was very docile at low speeds. It was the kind of thing, you know, you, it could be a grocery getter as a, as a high performance vehicle on the weekends. It was amazing the way it uh, performed. And even when you put your foot into it, the amount of control they put into traction control, torque steer, um, uh, all those kind of things, it was, you, you never felt like you were out of control. Wow. Oh. Oh. Great. Well, Ron, thank you so much for being our speaker today. This has been really informative. Thank you. Thank you. And Rotarians, I'm going to ring the bell. Ding. Our meeting is adjourned. Have a great rest of your week. And thank you again for being part of our first meeting for 2021.